All right, hello, Alice. We are passing around Roman coins. That's why it's crazy in here, but hopefully we can. Um, so here's what I would like you to do. Hey, guys. Hello. Um, if you are not currently looking at the coins, bring, your, bring everything that you have to give me, or just pass it this direction. You know, like you can give to them, and they can give to here, or you can get up and bring it to me. I'm good with that. And that way I can be tethered. Oh, yeah. Well, let's describe the division. Right. Oh, yeah. Billions of bullets. There's trillions of bullets. Yes, I should have. Yes, Hannah. Oh, you know what? Um, if you don't mind ripping it out, because I'd really like to read it, I don't want to just take your whole book. I'm sorry. I know that's irritating. I was going to like rewrite it somewhere else. It's okay. I'll give it back to you. Um, I'm sorry because we can't read yellow. I can read it. I have a Squint and I read. Okay. Hey guys, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started. So I should have your um, reading questions and your Eagle of the Ninth journals, okay? If, if, if you're giving me one. Um, and I'll just put Alice's stuff. Oh, Sophie, Sophie, because um, I'm attached now. Okay. Here is the question. Oh, okay, thank you. Put those there, actually. I will just grab one set. Okay, so hey guys, guys, do you think it's possible for me to talk and for you to listen and look at the coins at the same time? Do you? Not with Ethan. What? <laughs> Probably not. Wait, what? I wondered if I could, if you could look at coins and listen at the same time. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he was very sure of that. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to start in just because we've got sure. times a burning. We only have one more time. Does anybody know? I was asking Carl this earlier. So last next week is our last week of classes, but on the calendar I received the week after that it said end of year celebration. Mm -hmm. On May 5th. So are we actually going to see each other two more times after today? Okay, I will ask. I will ask. Nobody seems to be quite sure. And it's a potluck. Okay, we will we will find out. We we are distracted today. Just so you don't think I'm really, really terrible. Because I brought in Roman coins. My son got me a set of Roman coins, and we're looking at them while I set up the computer. But then, now I want to talk, and, and but people are distracted. But it's okay. So I'm just going to let people be distracted. I. It's bad. Um, so I asked you, on your reading questions, uh, what three tools used by Rome to conquer the world and govern the world? You remember? Tools. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Hold on, I Ella has been chosen. Uh, they had an army. They had an army. They had law. They had law. law. And they had um, like architecture and um, That's exactly language. Yes, Ethan. Ethan really wants to get in on this. Huh. Yes. Okay, I was going to say gra great buildings. They yes. are the great buildings. They yes. had a, lang a good language, like Latin, Yes. and then they had good roads. Okay, so yes, all of the above. I'm going to read directly out of the book the, the portion that I was thinking of, because it sums up chapter 22 beautifully. To conquer the world, Rome needed an army. To rule it, she needed law. To civilize it, she needed great buildings by means of which the strength and might of her power should be known a language by means of which the thought and wisdom of the ancient world could be handed on to the newer nations, which were growing up protected by her laws, and good roads and communications to serve as channels along which her civilization should pass. Yes, so all of those things he mentioned. And basically, that is what chapter 22 tells us. 
the army, the law, the buildings and public works, we'll call them, and language uh, that made Rome able to rule an area. Again, I keep saying this. Um, when I was doing class yesterday, I was thinking about this. I got my pen and I was kind of going across. It was about 2,000 miles. It was about 1,500 miles from north to south. And I think, I should look this up, I think the United States is roughly 3,000 miles across. I think it's about 3,000 miles from coast to coast, more or less. So this is like from the east coast to the Rocky Mountains or something like that. I don't know, north to south, 1,500 miles. I don't know how far it is from Canada to Mexico. 1,500 miles. So if it, the United States, except cutting off maybe California and Oregon and Washington, that's the size that we're talking about. And of course, we live in America and one place rules it. But what makes it easier for us today to rule such a large area? What do we have that they didn't have that makes it easier to govern a big area? What do you think, Kyle? More civilization. Well, but be more specific. I don't know that we're more civilized, frankly, but what do you think we have, Alex? Uh, well, we have democracy and we have states and provinces. Okay, we have, but, but the Romans divided up into, into bits to, gov well, they had a government. What do we have? Technology. Technology. And that's what I wanted you to, you, when you said civilization, we can communicate fast. We can travel fast. You know, um, so the high schoolers this year, they read the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. And it was people arguing over whether or not they should vote to adopt the Constitution in our country. And one of the big arguments against setting up a republic at that time was, it's too big. You can't run a republic this big because generally, thank you, it is, um, it was considered, yeah, the rule, that's not the right word, um, the guidelines for how big a, a landmass you can govern with certain types of government, that if it's big, you need a monarchy because you need one will to move quickly and act, and republics needed a smaller area. And so they were arguing, no, it's way too big, we can't be a republic. At that point, it was only up to the Mississippi River. But they didn't know roads would get better, communication would get better. Anyway, that was an aside. Um, so this is a huge area, but the Romans were so good at organization and doing useful things, building useful buildings, uh, structures, um, putting useful administrative organization into play. So the, I asked you about the army, I believe. Describe the divisions of the Roman army. I know somebody just off the top of their head, Alex. Totally knows the division. Um, right a, a legion contained 6,120 um, soldiers. Um, 6,000 of those <laughs> are uh, foot soldiers. Uh, cohorts, uh, there were 10 cohorts in a legion, so that would be about 612 people mm -hmm. per co co uh, cohort. Auxiliaries were um, the non-Romans of the army, uh, many times they could be drafted. Yeah, and something about the auxiliaries, um, the non-Romans, Dorothy Mills tells you that they don't let them serve in the province where they were recruited. So if you're British, you don't serve in Britain, you serve in Egypt, or you serve in the Middle East. Why? Because you won't know how to fight your home country. Yeah, okay, you don't want to fight your own home country. Plus, your, your cousins live down the road, and maybe your cousins invite you to have a drink and say, hey, let's overthrow the Romans. You know, it would be dangerous. And so they remove you and let you serve somewhere else. Uh, so Marcus was in charge of a cohort. He was a cohort commander, right? He was in charge of roughly 600 guys, which explains why Tribune Placidus, when he finds out that Marcus is a, tri uh, is a cohort commander, he's like, oh, boom, you're more important than I am. You are over 600 guys, and I'm just basically a secretary. Kind of got him a little jealous there. Uh, so army, army to conquer, to rule uh, law. That, our next, I'm going back to that great paragraph. 
To civilize, uh, no, to rule it, she needed law. I'm sorry. Um, Roman law was applied to everyone in the empire equally. Now, let me make a condition on that. Roman citizens were treated differently than non-Roman citizens, okay? Roman citizenship gave you certain rights. But if I live here, or I live here, or I live here, or I live here, the laws are the same. You know, um, my, my dad lived in Washington State, and when my kids were little, we drove out to Washington State to see him. And in Oregon, because um, he lives in southern Washington, across from Portland, anyway, we were in Portland, and they don't let you pump your own gas in Oregon. I know. I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. But so we pull into a gas station and we realize you have to go in and ask the attendant, which, okay, when I was a little girl, gas stations did that. They had people that came out. My grandpa never pumped his own gas. He always rang the bell and had the guy come out. Anyway. But nowadays we just think, oh, you self serve. Gas stations are self serve. And in Oregon, no, not so much. And so we went to another state, and the law was slightly different about pumping gas. However, most of the laws are the same. You know, anywhere we travel in America, we think, we, we know we have the same constitution, we have the same legal rights in America. There just might be small, tweaked variations locally. And that's what it was like in the Roman Empire. You might have a small variation locally, but overall, everyone had the same legal system. Imagine how difficult it would be if every single state completely had their own law code, disconnected from every other state. So every time, I live in Illinois, every time, hey gentlemen, are we, we with me? I don't have to relocate no, you like auxiliary troops. You could you could move to another chair. <laughs> no, never say I can't do anything. There's always a way. No, I mean I can't move, otherwise it squeaks. I understand. It's like when you wear the shoes that squeak after it rains, and then you go in the grocery store, and everybody you think everybody's looking at you because you squeak. Um, so I came over from Illinois. What if I had to study up on Iowa law? You know, to enter Iowa because I was afraid I might accidentally break the law. Yeah, in Iowa. Laws are really much different. Like we have we have constitutions. We do have theory. state constitutions, but they're they're overseen by our federal government. So basically, all law in America is the same. Yeah. Is my point. And basically, all law in the Roman Empire was the same, which made them one people, and which made travel um, easier in the sense that you don't have to study up on where you're going. Uh, another thing they did made travel easier. What are the Romans known for? Roads. Oh my goodness. They started building roads. The first major road is called the Appian Way, and it was just uh, in Italy. It was, I don't know, 300 miles something like that. 300 miles? No, it was shorter than that. But it was a pretty major undertaking. The Romans would, um, they would dig a trench. All right, this is a cross section. I'm looking along the trench. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then they'd fill the bottom with uh, kind of big, biggish rocks. Okay, I'm not going to do this very well. Okay, these are my big rocks. All right. And then a they'd lot, fill lot, lot. with, with um, a small, a slightly smaller, these are my slightly smaller rocks. All right, and then and then and then like gravel. This is my gravel. And then and then, if you had a local source of really good stone, they would lay slabs of stone on top, and it would be an honest to goodness paved road. But wait, there's more. They would they would make the inner the the middle part slightly raised, and they would dig ditches on the side so that the water would run off. I know, because if it freezes, you know how it happens in the winter here. It, it, water expands when it freezes, and then it cracks the, the pavement, and then we have to wait all summer while they're repairing. Not to be patching with asphalt, just saying. Um, it, 
was brilliant. So eventually, the Romans made 50,000 <coughs> miles of road like this. That's two times around the Earth. 50,000 miles of network <laughs> of good Roman roads. Now, who's building these? Who, who's the, who's the workforce? Anybody but Ella and Ellen. Huh? Who's the workforce building the roads? What's Kyle? Not the Roman uh, citizens. <laughs> Not the, uh, no, no, it is the Roman citizens. Uh, Ella, tell us. The soldiers. The soldiers. Mm -hmm. the soldiers are, um, okay, I'm just going to see if oh, I can. Poor soldiers. If I can reach That's my drink. Terrible. I, I can back. Oh, oh. I can do it. Yes. 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 Got it. Yes. Okay. The Roman soldiers aren't fighting all the time. If you're stationed somewhere and you don't have anything to do, they're not just going to pay you to sit around. They're going to put you to work. And one of the things they're going to put you to work doing is building roads. I do a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, no. I talked for three hours. I don't know why I'm thirsty. I talked for three hours. Yeah, there you go. Um, language. That was another thing that she mentioned. Uh, having a common language really, really helps if you want to govern a large area, right? Imagine if I was, spoke a different language than Illinois. Oh. I know. Oh, right? hi. And since you guys are Latin, I, I guess you're all taking Latin. Mm -hmm. Most of you, at least, are taking Latin. Um, Latin is going to serve as an international language up until the 1700s, early 1800s. Think about it. Isaac Newton, when he comes up with his gravitational laws, he writes it in a book in Latin. Oh, wow. Because all educated people knew Latin. If you lived in France or Germany or Spain, it didn't matter. You could read his book. So there's a there's a charming book. I'm so, I'm really all over the place today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Has anyone here ever read the book Carry On, Mr. Bowditch? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Do you remember Nathaniel Bowditch had to learn Latin to read Newton's Principia? Yeah. Okay, because it was written in Latin. This served us well for, if you think about it, to 2,500 years, people were using Latin. So when you're doing your Latin, just think I am in a grand it just seems tradition. Like you only learn Latin, you're just like, oh, when I'm working, learn Latin, you know? All my free time, learn Latin. Yes, yeah. well, it, it stands you in good stead. Um, and great buildings. Great buildings was the other thing that we talked about. Um, I asked you what architectural breakthrough. Ooh. Ethan. <laughs> Ethan, bring it on. Yes, yes you're right. Oh. Yes. What? Oh, the yes. The arch. The arch, yes. I thought we were raising hands. I'm slow on that. Okay. <laughs> the arch. So, why is this a big deal? Does anybody understand? I mean, it's pretty, but other than that, why? Oh. It's a lot stronger than the doorway like okay. this. And yeah, it's it's okay. And it, it, it's stronger, and it can do something else. It can, it, it makes something possible. I'm not asking this question very well. Let's, so let's do Ella's, the, the thing that you were talking about. So we have this. This is a, like a Greek temple or something. Basically a post with a big, heavy top, all right? It's all stable. It's, it's not very stable, and it's heavy. This is heavy. Gravity wants to push it down because it's so heavy. So you've got to have plenty. Maybe I need an extra column here to hold it up. Oh my gosh. So, so if I had a stone roof here, our roof is now stone. The ceiling is stone. Oh. Now, what do, I need, what do I need to make sure the roof doesn't fall down on my head? You need extra pillars. I need extra pillars. We've got one. <laughs> I hope that we have One more if the, if, the, if the roof is stone. And that means, imagine this room if it had 12 pillars. 
That'd be crowded. Okay, so yep. we can't really see across the room anymore. We don't have a big open space like this. When you build an arch, okay, this is gonna be Mrs. Ferguson's arch. It's not gonna be good. Mm -hmm. So you build, you, you have a wooden framework. And so you put the stones, you, you hopefully they're closer together and better than that. All right? Yeah, yeah, I know. My yeah, husband is the structural engineer. I am not the structural engineer, so. Okay, so then you get to this point, and you put in the key stuff. I, I, it's called the key, because it's the key to holding it all together. And they even make, you know they have block sets for little kids now, you know, where you can build your own arch, and you put the keystone in, and it holds itself together. The force, the downward force, runs into the sides. It's very stable, and you don't need a pillar to hold it up. Sometimes they might put an extra uh, support over on the side you know, to run some of the extra forces through the ground. Um, but this can all be open. It can all be open. Now it's holding itself up. What? Now it's holding itself up. It's holding itself up. So and then hold the roof up. It is the roof. It is, okay. it is the roof. So the Romans were able to build huge domed buildings, and I brought, oh, I don't think you guys are going to be able to see very well. Hey, guys. We're, we're counting up the, we're doing the, oh, okay, okay. The average one, you know, for the question. Oh, yes, you're doing your math, the math question that I asked you. Um, hang on, I brought my cool book. No, no. Did you say, tell me it's not? Like you didn't want it to be? Is that what I heard you say? Okay, so this is not a very good, this is, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. This is the Pantheon. Hadrian built this, um, this domed temple in Rome. And it was Pantheon means all the gods. It was dedicated just to all the gods jointly. And it's a huge, beautiful domed structure that they were able to do with large interior spaces, which is just very grand. So maybe I'm visiting Rome for the first time. I come from Northern Gaul and I visit Rome and I walk into these buildings and I'm just blown away. I so want to be Roman. I want to be a part of this because it's just gorgeous. Does that make sense? Uh, the other thing they used arches for were um, about the, that was the second that was the second half of his question. What structure did they build on a larger scale than any <gasps> previous? Hannah, bridges, aqueducts, and aqueducts. Yes, which is sort of like a bridge. Off when it crosses a river, it's like a bridge. Um, so bridges, we know what bridges are. Aqueducts. This is an easy question. What do they carry? Water. 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 So why? Rome is next to a river. Why do they need water brought in? Because they're thirsty. Plants. <laughs> okay. Because they're thirsty. Plants. Kyle? I was just going to I was going to Livestock. Livestock. Baths. Baths. How about to drink? To drink? So here's the thing. What happens... When a town is next to a river, what happens to the river? Floods. It could messy. flood. It gets messy. Because you know what? We, we wash all our poo and stuff into the river. Yeah. I'm sorry, but we do. We do. And the Romans had, the Romans had public toilets. They had, which were not like, didn't have stalls. I just steamed. Like I just had to hold it the whole time I was in Rome. I just don't think I could do that. But they had so a stone seat, and you sit on it. And this is important. This is good. And water, water would flow through the trench underneath to rinse it all out, so it didn't smell. And it was like you know how outhouses are. We've all used a porta potty. Yeah. You know. But those smells. Those smell. And so the water would go on this trough and it would rinse it all, but it has to rinse it somewhere. And it would rinse it into a sewer system, just like we have a sewer system under the ground, and it would rinse it out into the Tiber River. 
So we don't want to drink that anymore. We probably don't want to, we don't want to wash our clothes in it. Let's bring water in. So eventually they had 10 aqueducts bringing water in from mostly north of, well, more, mostly the uh, east of Italy, or east of Rome. Um, and some of these aqueducts went for miles and miles, like, I don't know what, I should look up what the longest aqueduct is. We're talking 60, 80, 100 miles. A long thing. Not, not briefly. I, I hope I'm not lying to you. I'll have to look this up. That book I was just looking in, it's not a poem book. It didn't tell me how long the longest aqueduct is. Now, what happens if I take my water from my jug and I pour it into the middle of the table? It's going to go to Okay, is it going to go any particular direction? No. Oh, do you mean water won't go in a certain direction unless it's tilted? Oh my God. What if I want my water to go 50 miles away through an aqueduct? <sighs> it's got to be slightly tilted the entire length. I'm, I've got to figure that out as a Roman engineer. I've got to figure out not only how to carry it across ravines and rivers that it might cross over, but I've got to make sure the water will actually keep flowing. I know, I'm glad what you have that face. What if the bird poops in it? Oh, they had roofs. I mean, a bird could go in, but you know what? A little bit of bird poo on that lake <laughs> compared to all the poo of Rome in the Tiber. I'd go for the little bird poo. Wow, I'm yes. glad I hate birds. That's <laughs> Kyle. Uh, um, I would be, um, oh, it's the corkscrew. So it lets the water up and so it can keep flowing. the Archimedes. Oh, uh, yes, I don't, I don't know that they made use of that, but, yeah. okay, we I have. Googled, over 500 years, 11 aqueducts were built to bring water to Rome for this far away, 57 miles. 57 miles, which is a pretty decent mm -hmm. distance. But remember, they're not only bringing water to Rome. They're bringing water to major cities all over. Um, Everybody's got a city. Uh, Europe, anyway. So when I was 18, I got to go to France. And we were in southern France by Nice, where Nice is today. And there's a famous aqueduct there. And we went down, um, it's called the Pont du Gard. And um, almost every time you look up an aqueduct, they show this one because it's in really good condition. And we got, I don't know, we got baked goods at a French bakery or something. We sat down and had a little picnic. And then you can walk up and you can walk through the aqueduct. You can climb up there and you can walk through the tunnel. Sometimes they had, they were double deckers because they were bringing water in from more than one water source. And this one was a double decker. And so we, we walked through one of them and you, and it would have, it had a roof and you could walk through the tunnel. And it was, I don't know, this was a long time ago. But I mean, it was, it was pretty wide. I mean, it wasn't claustrophobic or anything like that. And tall enough that you didn't need to bend over or anything. And there were, there were open places periodically, but most of it was covered. And the, at the openings, it would have Latin inscriptions of who made it and the date and everything. It was very cool. It was empty. There was no water currently running through it. Um, oh, yeah. no, poo. Yeah. And no poo and no water, <laughs> as far as I saw. Because in summer, it's still in use. Wow. Yeah. You know, so when I was in Greece, um, in Delphi, uh, my, my son and I, took a hike down, you could hike down to the Corinthian Gulf. We checked in the hotel and we looked out and we saw goats coming up a track. And we thought, I wonder what's down there. So the next morning before our bus came, we went down there and we could saw something way down in the distance and we thought it was a, a highway. We just saw this flat, we got there and it was an aqueduct, but it was not a Roman, it was a modern aqueduct. And uh, so we were checking out of the hotel, and he said, well, did you take your walk? And I said, yeah. We walked down to the, to the, to the waterway. He said, yeah. Um, it, it runs water to Athens. And this was, I don't know, 80 miles away or something? Like, what? So apparently, that sort of system is still out. But this was, like I said, this was modern. This was a modern construction. But it was the same idea. So how they were bringing oh, it's kind of like water towers, but it's all on yes, the ground. Yes, and they and they, but they empty it into a water tower when it gets to its destination, so that people can use it, or some sort of reservoir. It's probably not a tower, but a reservoir. Yeah. Um, 
So if they didn't use Alchemy's corkscrew, how did they get that high enough for the um, research? I don't know. I don't, I, maybe they did, maybe you can do some in, independent research, Kyle. What if? I am not an engineer and that is not what if? particularly what I'm interested in. What if? I just yeah. like, I turn on the faucet and it works. That's what I know. Yes. What if, um, like they built one from the top of a mountain? Like, or, and then like, oh. as the summer came, the snow melted, or like some of the snow melted and then it ran down. That could, that could work. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Um, so that, that was chapter 22. Chapter 23, we're back to discussing uh, the situation in the empire as things are winding down. So we are, the dates they gave you was 180 to 284, and you've been doing your math. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this table ah, go. Yeah, we all did this. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so you you two get the, all the rest of the, the rest of the questions. Okay. Okay. There's only two more questions. Right. Okay. okay. So mm -hmm. how many emperors ruled from 180 to 284? That was the first question. Twenty nine. Do some math and figure out the average. Do it. What? Three point six. Three point six. Which is about a little more than three and a half years. I got, I got three and two-thirds. Yeah. I, I just yeah, that's that's depends on how. 3.6 is three-fifths. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so that's not good <laughs> if you get a new ruler every three and a half years. Why were they switching out so fast? They were dying. Only, yeah. only four. And they weren't dying naturally. <laughs> only four of the 29 died. Only four. Yeah. Of People were coming in, wiping out the previous ruler. Uh, who was doing a lot of the wiping out? Do you remember? You, Alex? The Praetorian. The Praetorian Guard. It's like the Secret Service just starts killing off presidents and making new presidents. Oh what? But you know what? They were strong, they were powerful, they had weapons, and they had the whole army at their back. This is not a good time. This is not a good time in Roman history. I mean, it was bad. The year 69 was really bad when we had four emperors in one year. It never got that bad again. But it was pretty bad. Yeah, Alex. Um, and it got so bad that the Praetorian Guard sold the um, yes. idol of emperor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To, the highest, to the highest bidder. Can you imagine so we're auctioning so off the emperorship? It's like it's on eBay, and you can go buy the emperorship. Well, who wants to get killed in three years? Mm. Set it right here. Yeah. Who else wants to get this? I wouldn't want it. <laughs> Crazy. Well, so, uh, everyone can lose money because if you're the emperor, oh. you can get money. So it's just like yes. keep all your money and get it. Um, but apparently, then die in three years. Yes. <laughs> then die in three years. Then if you're like really old, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, it was a bad time, and we're talking about a century here. And you can see how things are falling apart. Remember, we talked about Trajan, where the empire reached its greatest extent. And after that, it's just going to start shrinking. I need to send, mm, I'm going to try to remember to email this out to you. I found a thing on the internet. It's an animated Roman map, and it has a timeline. And it shows it expanding, expanding, and you can watch it shrink in again, and you can watch the provinces get lost. I, I will try to remember. Oh, try to remember. If one of you thinks of it, you could email me. If you don't get the link and say, Mrs. Ferguson, you said you'd send us a link, but you didn't do it. Because your brain doesn't hold anything long enough. To <laughs> I can remember all this stuff, but I can't remember. <laughs> all right, Ferguson. I don't know. So, eventually, we got, are we with me? I have to save, I have another class after this. Oh, so my throat will be all gravelly if I raise my voice too much. Um, <clears throat> eventually, we get to an emperor named Diocletian. Diocletian had a plan. Which one of you wants the plan? I don't really like that. Oh, you should. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we'll give it to Alan the last one. Yes, do it. Do it. Okay. 
he, Are we listening, guys? Yes. He was really um, full of himself, and he, you know, wanted people to worship him. <laughs> but he realized that he couldn't rule all of, like, the whole world area by himself. So he divided it up into the east and the west, and then he divided it into groups of ten, and then he just kept, just dividing kept, just kept subdividing until it. he got. Into and then each one has like its its governor. Yes. So the big the big thing was right about here, all right, between the heel, the heel of Italy and Greece. We ran a line. And this is the west, and this is the east, obviously. And yes, he, then he subdivided. Interestingly, one of the subdivisions um, is, was called dioceses. Diocese? This is still the administrative unit of the Catholic Church. Um, Davenport is the seat of its diocese. Peoria is the diocese, I think, of, on the Illinois side. And um, so let me spell it, because it's, it's very interesting that when, when the Roman Empire on this side started falling apart, who was there to pick up the pieces? Who was the only authority left? The Eastern? Yes, but who was there to pick up the pieces in the, the West? Church. Oh. The church. That was the only authority left. This is why Pope Leo was going out negotiating with Attila the Hun. Because there was no one else to do it. And so the administrative system that had been put in place, they just adopted it. And they still use it today. They refer to each division as a diocese, yes. What do you mean by the diocese for Davenport of the Catholic Church? Um, I think, so So the Catholic Church, bishops have a, an area that they oversee. And that, that area is called their diocese. And wherever the bishop lives and has his seat, that's where the cathedral is. That's what cathedral means. You probably know that. It means the seat of the bishop. And I believe the Davenport, the, the cathedral's in Davenport. Oh, wow. The Davenport is the cathedral. But the cathedral on the other side is in Peoria. That's where the bishop lives. I think I've seen it. And, the, and this is interesting, too, because the, the rulers of each of these divisions, they called a vicar. Vicar, when we say we do something vicariously, we mean we do it through someone else. A vicar is someone who administrates on behalf of someone above them. And this is still often what they call country preachers in the Anglican Church in England. He's the vicar. He's, he's, he's in place of Christ for you in the sense that um, he's administrating the sacraments and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the Pope goes, is called the Vicar of Christ because he's been put in charge of the church in acting in Christ's name. Anyway, but my point is not all of that. My point is these are Roman administrative terms from Diocletian's time that are still used, which is fascinating. It takes a long time to be using the same term, you know, and the same title. Okay, so Diocletian decided Enough with this whole murdering people to take over. This has got to stop, which is true. And so he said, we're going to have two parts, and each part is going to have an emperor. And they're called the Augustus. There's an Augustus of the East and an Augustus of the West. And then there's going to be like a vice Augustus, all right, like vice president. And he's the Caesar. And he's waiting in the wings. So when the Augustus dies, the Caesar takes over. He becomes the Augustus and picks a new Why Caesar. Why do we still use that? You know, America, so we just, we yes, have, yeah. we have a vice president to step in. And so Diocletian set this system up. We're good, we're good. And then he retired. I, the only Roman emperor I can think of that retired. Didn't just stay emperor until he died. He retired. Probably didn't want to be sure. Yeah, I suppose so. And he made, he was, okay, I think the Eastern. Who? Diocletian. Diocletian was the Eastern. Okay, and he made his Western counterpart retire too. He kind of forced him into retirement so the Caesars could take over and they could make the, the system work. All right? 
However, the emperor, the Augustus on this side, um, was Constantius, he, which may or may not belong to one of my coins. Okay. And he was in Britain, and he died before he really took over. And instead of the Caesar taking over, the army wanted Con Constantius' son, Constantine, to become the next emperor. It was the old story, you know. The army says, oh, we, we love, love him. him. Please make him emperor. Yeah. And so we had a problem because we have the system breaking down already. Constantine, uh, and it, you know, you might, I don't know, if I were Constantine, I, I, I'd like to think I would say, no, no, that's not the way we do things. I'm sorry, I'm glad you love me, but, but I can't become emperor because that's not the new rules. He didn't do that. But also, if a bunch of guys with weapons were standing around me telling me they wanted me to be emperor, I don't know what I would do. I don't know what they would have said. Anyway, Constantine took him up on it. So he comes down, and he's got a rival. He's got a rival in Maxentius, the, the, the legit ruler. The story, oh, oh no, we're not Wait, there. Wait, in Maxentius, is he, <clears throat> was he the one who um, was ruled with the, the taxation. Yeah. So I think he was the next one he under. Was okay. Yeah. Okay. So the story says that Constantine is marching with his army, and he is in Italy, and he's approaching the Milvian Bridge, and he's camped there with his army. And the night before, he has a dream, or he sees a vision, you know, and he sees a sign. We don't even know what the sign was. In a lot of stories, it's a cross. In some of them, it's the Cairo symbol. Do you know what I mean by that? This is the Greek letter Chi, and this is the Greek letter Rho, and it's the first two Greek letters in the name Christ. So sometimes you will see religious, you know, like communion tables or something like that, and they might have a Cairo symbol on it. I've got it, it's a screensaver on my phone, which is a little weird. It's just a Cairo symbol. Um, <laughs> We don't know, but it was obviously a Christian symbol of some sort. And the Latin words in hoax and neo vince, in this sign you will conquer. And he decided that he would put this sign, whether it was a cross or a Cairo symbol, I don't know, on his soldier shields and go into battle in the name of this Christian God. And he won. And he decided that that was because the Christian God had granted him the victory and that he needed to serve this Christian God. So lay it on us, Alex. What did the Edict of Milan pronounce? It uh, gave religious freedom to Christians. Christianity is Yay. legal. No. <laughs> only, but only for a little, a little, a little blip under Julian Fossey. So I want to read something, though. I want to read to you, you know, I usually say to students, just imagine if last night when you went to bed, being a Christian may at any moment cost you your life. You probably have family members or friends who have been tortured or died because they were Christians, and then you woke up the next morning and found out it was legal. But it's even more pronounced when you learn Diocletian was one of the most rabid persecutors of Christians there was. The persecution under Diocletian was severe, horrible, violent. It's like, I, I like history because I know God's doing something. I don't always know what he was doing. In the Bible, we know what he's doing because he says. Do you know what I mean? Like we know why the Israelites wipe out the Canaanites because God, but I don't know why Joan of Arc led the soldiers of the front. You know what I mean? Like what, what is God doing here? I don't know because I don't have any revelation from him. But he's doing, he's doing something. I know he's doing something. It's almost like Satan knew his days were numbered 
and he lashed out and he took as many down in that last persecution as he could. Um, so I brought my Fox's Book of Martyrs, which I had talked about a few weeks ago. I just want to read uh, just a very short section. I mean, it's a long Diocletian section, and it's, it's not very good. But <clears throat> let me read this. It was during Diocletian's reign that Galerius, his adopted son and successor, agitated by his mother, who was a bigoted pagan, convinced the emperor to eliminate Christianity from the Roman Empire. The day scheduled to begin the bloody work was February 23rd, 303. It began in Nicomedia, the capital of Diocletian's Eastern Roman Empire. Early that morning, the chief of police and large numbers of officers and assistants made their way to the main Christian church and forced open its doors and ransacked the buildings and burned all its sacred books. Diocletian and Galerius had accompanied them to witness the beginning of the end of the Christian religion. Not satisfied with the burning of the books, they had the building leveled to the ground. Following this, Diocletian issued an edict that all Christian churches and books were to be destroyed. All Christians were to be arrested as traitors to the empire. When the edict was posted in a public place, a bold Christian immediately tore it down and denounced the name of the emperor for his injustice. For his public display of contempt for the emperor, he was arrested, tortured, and burned to death. Every Christian in Nicomedia was arrested and put into prison. Um, Galerius secretly ordered the imperial palace set on fire and Christians blamed as the arsonists. From this, a general persecution started through the empire and lasted 10 years, during which thousands of Christians were martyred. Um, I'm just going to read just some random stuff. Many Christian houses were set on fire with entire families perishing in the flames. Heavy stones were hung about the necks of many, and they were tied together and dra driven into the Sea of Marmara. Racks, scourges, fire, swords, daggers, crosses, poison, and starvation were all used individually and collectively. In the region of, Phryg region of Phrygia, which is this area here, um, I've lost my place. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. In the region of Phrygia, a city in which all the citizens were, were Christians was burned and all the inhabitants were forced into the flames to perish. Um, finally, weary with the slaughter, the governors of several provinces appealed to the emperor on the basis that such conduct on the part of Romans was improper. Thus, many Christians were saved from death but were mutilated in such ways as to make their lives miserable. Many had their ears cut off, their noses slit, one or both eyes put out, bones torn out of their sockets and their flesh burned in conspicuous places. So they were ever marked as Christians. Okay, this goes on for pages. I, I don't want to read more pages, but I just want you to, to understand, this is, it, it had been bad at times. This was bad. And this was, remember this is the year 303. Anybody remember from like, Classical Conversations Timelines, Edict of Milan? Yeah. The year? What year? Was it in your was it in something that you oh, memorized? I forgot. Yeah. It's okay. It's probably a history sentence. <laughs> well, wasn't it? 313. No. Oh. Sorry. I'm sorry. I have to move along. Sorry. Oh, I guess it's not. Oh, I guess we have more time. I got you confused with the high schoolers that are down at a quarter till. He said, I'm not. My brain isn't. Working on all cylinders today. Constantine ended the persecutions and made Christianity legal. He did something else, and I wanted to talk about this. Dorothy Mills doesn't talk about this at all. I mean, it's really, um, it's a really big um, thing that Constantine is known for. Um, but to talk about that, I need to give you some backstory. Uh, well, for Actually, before I give the backstory, let me ask you a question. If becoming a Christian is going to cost me mutilation, torture, and death, very likely, am I just going to sign on lightly to become a Christian? Like, if I'm kind of lukewarm about it, am I going to go ahead and do it? Am I going to do it just because the neighbors? Like, oh, I'm going to church because the neighbors go to church. No, no. I'm, I'm probably pretty hardcore. I love the Lord. I'm willing to die for him. Now, flip it over. If it's not only legal, but you know that the ruler of the empire really likes Christians, might some people be tempted to become Christians for reasons other than loving God? Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe 
your neighbors will think more highly of you. Maybe you'll run in better social circles. Maybe you'll get a better job because the emperor will look favorably on you because you're a Christian. And we get a flood of people into the church. This is the downside. The downside of persecution is very easy to see. Nobody wants to, to be tortured and die. But one of the church fathers, his name is Tertullian, and he is famous for saying that the blood of the Christians is the seed of the church. That the more they killed them, the more it grew, strangely. But when they weren't being persecuted anymore and it got very easy to be a Christian, we got a lot of people coming in that didn't really care so much about God, so much as more, cared more about appearances. Does that make sense? And they brought with them some kind of odd ideas. And, and you know, there weren't a lot of, th there were heresies. First of all, I'm gonna use the term heresy. What is a heresy? We just don't, that's not a very polite term. People don't use that term anymore, but they still exist, yes. Um, a, uh, an act or idea that goes against a religion. Okay. It's, it's, yes, and it's even more than that. It comes from the Greek word that means to choose. Hyrio hmm. means to choose. So heretics, choose what they will believe and what they won't believe. Oh, okay. Rather than what the church teaches. All right? We'll just we'll just pick what to believe. Oh, okay. And we'll interpret it our way. Yeah, I So it's like um, for example, someone would believe that God like John 3:16 like he loves the world like he knew saved it. Um, and then and then they turn like they don't believe in that they're the wrath of God. So like they pick and choose out of the Bible. They pick and they choose. They pick and choose. This is a very good point because a lot of people, that's a, that's a big in theological, well, everybody's going to be saved in the end because God loves everybody. But we can't just choose that and ignore the out in the outer darkness wailing and gnashing of teeth part because we don't like it. We don't get to do that. Yeah. You yeah, can. there's a church like um, that's really by me. It's called Metropolitan Church. Mm -hmm. It's like it's basically that's basically what it is. It's like this this pastor just picked and choose and chose whatever he wanted to be in the church. Like God loves everyone. God loves everyone. You know. Yes. So and we God like I mean, God does, a couple of I don't yeah. think this is going to offend anybody in this room. I guess I don't really care. But Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons would be two heretical groups. Mm -hmm. They kind of have the trappings of Christianity. They use the same language and they talk about Jesus, but they're they're not Christians. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just I'm not mm. trying to be mean and say I hate more I, I don't hate any Mormons. I'm sure they're nice people, but they're not Christians it, because they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus and the virgin birth and all the the things that Christians believe in. They don't believe in it. So they're heretics. Okay. So, but let's de detach it from us and go back here. So we get lots of heresies arriving. So one of the early, um, I'm just gonna go on this, riff on this, because we got plenty of time. Um, and you guys have probably heard about this a little bit, the Gnostics. Um, the Apostle John, who lived to a pretty old age, you know, wrote about this, people that deny that um, the material world is good, um, that only spirit is good. Spirit is good, but they've made a choice, haven't they? They've forgotten, oh, God made the world and called it very good. Mm -hmm. um, material things aren't evil. That would be Plato teaching, <laughs> not God teaching. And they were a big force in the very, very early church. There's a story that in his old age, the apostle John walked into a public baths and, and, and then he walked out because he knew there was a, a well-known Gnostic in there named Marcion, and he turned around and said, I know who's in there, you know, the, I think he called him the firstborn of Satan, called him something not very nice, um, because he was leading people astray. Okay, so it did happen before Constantine. There were undercurrents of people making these choices, but about the time of Constantine, there was a big one, and it came from North Africa, and there was a 
I don't remember if he was a priest or a bishop. I don't remember what level he was. His name was Arius. And Arius was a fine thinker. I don't know, maybe he was a nice guy. I don't know. But he just thought and thought and thought about this Trinity idea. Mm. Okay? Oh, and he yeah. said, here's the problem. Now I'm being Arius. I'm not being me, okay? So yeah, if I say okay. something, you know, I'm not being me. There's only one God. That Jesus is God, but I don't understand because there's God the Father is God. And Jesus is the kid. He has more than one God. So I think what really what it means when, when they talk about this is that Jesus is just really special. And and it calls him the only begotten son. And that means he must have started sometime. He must have a beginning, you know, to be begotten. So there used to be a time when there was no Jesus back in the dim reaches of eternity and and he was created he was created by god the father and and so he's not really totally god but he's kind of special this is arius he's kind of special yeah he's just like, like a normal guy he's not just a normal human being because there were people teaching that too that jesus was just a normal person who god specially loved and adopted as his oh yeah son that's the like jesus that. thing but, but Arius was beyond that. He's more important than that. But, but this, this just can't be. We can't have more than one God because this is wrong. This is what Arius says. So this idea starts spreading throughout the empire because it makes sense. And frankly, the Trinity does not make sense to our brains, right? Yeah. We can't understand how three can be one and one can be three because our math doesn't work like that. We just know that it is. And and we can do examples of it, but we can't really, like, I don't get it. Yeah, Hannah. Well, does it go to the point where we just have to accept it Faith. as it is? Yes. It is a mystery how the three are one and the one are three. What does mystery mean again? Like a, a sacrament. Uh, um, uh, that's but In Latin, it's a sacrament. A, a, a um, Something the church believes or presents or does physically that actually represents what it is. So, so like communion is a sacrament in the, in the sense that it really, Baptism. really is participating. Baptism is a sacrament. Because it really, really, I mean, you're just dipping in the water, but it really, really, really washes your sin away. Like it really does what it symbolizes. That's a sacrament. So it's, so it's mysterious. But Aries, this spread. This spread like wildfire. And there was a, there was a bishop in, oh, I ought to know, but I think it was Carthage. And his name was Athanasius. And Athanasius said, no. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. But the problem was, the, it was filtering in through the church, and you had bishops and priests that were Arian. They were teaching the teachings of Arius. And they would appeal to their superiors, and they got poor Athanasius banished. They got him banished five times. And he kept leaving his hometown and going out and living wherever in exile and writing and saying, Arius is wrong, Jesus is God. I'm telling you, Jesus is God. There's a phrase, the phrase associated with Athanasius. Athanasius Contra mundum, let's see if you, one of them you'll know, I bet you can figure it out. Uh, what's his name, contradict the what? Uh, the contradict comes from contra, uh, it right. means it's him against, yeah. against the world. Athanasius against the world. When the whole world seemed like it was turning Arian, Athanasius, nope, Jesus is God, you can exile me as many times as you like, but I'm not gonna shut up and I'm not gonna stop saying that Jesus is God. He wrote a great book called On the Incarnation. I think why God needed to become man. Okay, anyway, that's, that was a long, that was a backstory. For Constantine, this is just erupting all over the empire. And people are, I mean, like, okay, this is not very nice, but people are having fights in the streets, you know, like Arians versus Christians believing the truth. And Constantine decided this needed to stop. That God had placed him in charge of the empire. And of course, P 
peace is good if you're a ruler. You don't want people fighting in the streets. And he called a council to the town of Nicaea, which is just across, there's, you know, there's water, it's just right over here. By the way, can I just, no, we'll, we'll go back. Remind me to go back to talk about Constantinople. Somebody, uh, you, you, you're, my, you're my brains that are outside my body. I will. You're all my all brains right helping. Okay, he called a council in 325. Oh, there are a lot of threes, 325. And he invited bishops from all over the empire to come and discuss this question. Is Arius right or is Athanasius right? What does the church mean by Jesus is God. What exactly does that mean? Do they mean he's kind of like God? That he's godly? He's actually God? What does the church teach about this? Yes. Um, that, that Jesus and God are the same, but Jesus is the Son and God is the Father, but they're both the same yes. because of the Trinity. Yes. And but but that was the that was the thing at at, at, at stake. We take this for granted because. Those of us growing up in the church, we don't, okay, we don't really understand it, like I said, the idea of the Trinity, but we get it. Jesus is completely, in every way, God, as much as God the Father is every way God. But they weren't sh sure what the legit teaching was at this point. So he calls, I think it's over 300 bishops come. Many of them had been tortured under Diocletian. Many of them are sitting there with their ears cut off or the brands from the fire. This was important. They were willing to suffer and die for this church, for this truth. It meant a lot to them. They gathered them together, and Arius came and gave, gave a spiel. As Arius came in person, Arius came to his guys. Okay, this is what I think. And they brought, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call them orthodox with a small o, um, people believing the truth you know, as it, as it was handed out from the apostles, okay? And they gave their spiel, this is, this is what we believe. So they decided to write down a statement of what the church teaches about this. And this statement is still in many, many churches said out loud every week when you gather to worship. It is called the Nicene Creed. Creed comes from credo in Latin. It means I believe. A creed is a statement of what you believe. Like you could you could start a club and have your own creed. Like we believe that boys are bad and they shouldn't come in our clubhouse and you know and Twinkies are not as good as ding dongs. That's not much of a creed, <laughs> but it could be. Like we this is what our club believes. All right. The Nicene Creed was a statement, a carefully crafted statement of what the church believes. And, um, and I, I've got most of it memorized, but I, I'm ashamed that I don't have it all memorized. Okay, I believe in God the Father Almighty, um, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Um, and then it goes into this very long, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same substance with the Father, who with the Father is adored and glorified. Okay, that's all about Jesus. And it's just really repetitive. Are you kidding? God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. They're being very specific because they're fighting Arianism. And so that, that phrase, of one substance with the Father, in Greek, it's Homoousios. The Arians, I think this is hilarious, wanted to put this word instead. Homoousios. This means exactly the same substance or essence. This means of similar. Similar. One letter. Well, so there are historians who write histories of the church, but they're not Christians, you know, and they're just kind of mocking at it. And they'll say this, these people were just so stupid 
because they had a big fight over one letter. <laughs> okay, this letter meant everything though. It meant everything because one side was saying God the Father and Jesus the Son are both equally and fully God. And the other side was saying Jesus the Son is like God. He's very similar. Like, no. No. The creed then goes on to talk about, because that talks about who Jesus is in his godhood, then it goes on to say um, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under, the Pontius, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose again. So then we're talking about him in his manhood. They don't want you thinking, oh, he's fully God, so he's just some spirit thing. He really came. He really died. He really suffered. He really was born. Okay. Anyway, Constantine at the Council of Nicaea in 325, they set the course for what the church believes. Um, and then there's a addendum. It's about the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to go on to the Holy Spirit part because we're not talking about that today. Um, if the Arians had won, the true faith would have disappeared. Or I don't think that God would let the true faith disappear, so it would have gone underground again. But um, this, this pops into next year when we talk about the Middle Ages. There are going to be barbarian hordes taking over the Roman Empire. Many of them are going to be converted to Aryan Christianity. Many of them are going to be Aryan. And it's going to take hundreds of years to stamp this out. Yes? Wait, are we actually... Are we going to do Middle Ages with, um, with um, A next year? No, because, because um, so in high school, yeah. I operate more in just junior high, high school. So we're, we're swinging back around again, and it's the, it's the literature of Greece. So you're reading the Iliad and the Odyssey and Herodotus and the Peloponnesian War and all of that. Oh, okay. so, so, and then the next year is Rome, and then the next year is a whole year with the Middle Ages. Is that what Catholicism is considered in high school? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so they'll be in junior high and we'll be in high school? I, I don't know. Whoever's an eighth grader, I don't know. It's up to your parents. Like, if you're an eighth grader this year, I guess you'll move into high school next year. And if you're a seventh grader, then you'll move into eighth grade. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, thank you for following me on this journey because it, it gets a little dry sometimes, but it's, it's the reason that we're sitting in a church openly today. It's the reason that the true faith has not been lost. The fact that these people were willing to be tortured and suffer for the truth. And the fact that people like Athanasius were willing to be exiled over and over and over to stand up for the simple fact that Jesus is God. Um, gentlemen, are we still? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Um, another kind of creepy heretic group is going to arise. They're called the Docetists. Dokio means seem or appear in, in, in Greek. And they, they were the flip side. They said Jesus wasn't really a human being at all. He didn't really have a body. It was just an illusion. Nice. Cause, nice. Cause, and their reason was God can't die. God is life. God can't die. Jesus can't be God. So if he is God, he didn't even have a body. That's kind of creepy. It is. So it was some weird stuff. So the first... Up until around the year 600, 700 AD, the church is still working out things that we take for granted. There's still people coming up with some pretty weird ideas about how to interpret Jesus as God. What, what does that mean? Or Jesus as man. What does that mean? And we are the heirs of that. So when we shrug, it's like, of course. There were hundreds of years of debates there were people being exiled from where they were bishop or where they were priest just for teaching what we accept as the truth now. Yes, Kyle? The New Testament was not made yet? The New Testament was not put together. So the writings of the New Testament were already written, yeah. but they had not decided which books belonged in the Bible yet. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the 300s, it was in that century, that they finally came to a certain level of consensus that these are the books that belong in the Bible and these are not the books. And there were there was five extra that were if we There were still there were still um, Revelation was a long time. Like, 
contractions like over like through the Middle Ages and um, even modern times like the eight, like the 1700s, mm -hmm. there were still like modern like grammatical like corrections and um, and chapters like they put them in chapters. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, there were no chapters. But yeah, at this point, like there was a famous book called The Shepherd of Hermas um, that early churches used as part of their church services. They read them in church, but it was later not accepted as part of the, the canon, they call it, which is, just means the rule, the, the books that we collect, that we decided What's these have scriptural authority. I'm sorry, what? It's so good. Yeah, it's very weird. It's, it's, um, it's very mystical and it's, it's, it's weird. But I mean, it's perfectly fine. I mean, it's probably free online, Shepherd of Hermas. I don't know. It's not real exciting, but but a lot of a lot of a lot of early churches found it to be good moral instruction, and they used it. But eventually, they said, you know what? The Shepherd of Hermas is out. I mean, it's a good edifying book. It's sort of like there's lots of good books to read, right? That help you in your Christian walk. But it's not scripture. We're not including it in the Bible. Um, so yeah, so different churches were appealing to different books. Revelation, like I said, was a, was a toughie for a while. They weren't sure if that should be. Third John, the, the third letter of John, there was like, some. There's only a few Johns. Yeah, like we got enough John. No, that wasn't it. <laughs> I think at some times they were just like, is this really written by the apostle? There was some. And then there are extra books that claim to be in, by one of the apostles, but later they decided they didn't really teach what the church believes, and they were probably not written by one of the apostles. And they, like there's a Gospel of Thomas, I think, or a Doubting Thomas that didn't make the cut. Anyway. Like writing, like yeah. All right, well, you know what? I've drug you guys through aqueducts, bridges, the construction of arches, heresy, persecution, Nicene Creed. I feel like my job's done here for one day. I don't care if it is early. Um, oh, but we got a uh, Oh, and then you go on the ninth. Constantinople. Oh my gosh, I did. Oh, Constantinople. Never mind. Wait, sorry, I'm not done. Can I have a thought of the idea of God of Order? Jesus is special, not God. Arius. A R I U S. Arius. Okay, so yes, thank you, outside, outside brain. Now, I'm not gonna go on and on about this one. Um, Constantine decided that uh, for his new regime and his new Christian empire, we needed a new capital. And there had been a city long ago on uh, the Black Sea here called Byzantium. It was a Greek colony. Remember last semester we talked about the Greeks sending out all its colonies all over? Byzantium was a Greek colony. and. Uh, so he took over the city. He renamed it after himself, Constantinople, and uh, made it his new capital. This is important for various reasons. But the biggest reason it's important is, remember we have the empire cut in half? Mm -hmm. Remember we have the West and the East? Which briefly under Constantine it was reunited, but they, they split it again. Eventually it was split. This side, and this is what you're going to read about this coming week. This side, it's not going to go well. This, this from the, the west side. We got people just pouring in over the borders. But over here, that doesn't happen. The east goes on, and it goes on. So the traditional date of the fall of Rome is 476. There's going to be a Roman emperor in Constantinople until 1453. Another thousand years. So they always say the Roman Empire fell. Yeah, half of it fell. We just forget about the other half. Because there's a guy calling himself the Roman Emperor until 1453. Think about it. 1492 is Columbus. Whoa. Till Whoa. 40 years before, I know. When you say it like that, you're like, what? 40 years before Columbus sailed, there's still a Roman emperor in Constantinople? Yeah. Until the Turks come 
from the and they take over all Turkey, Turkey Turks, and they uh, take down Constantinople. So what is Constantinople called today? Istanbul. Istanbul. Do you guys know the song? Istanbul, Constantinople, Constantinople. Istanbul. I've heard that too many times. Yes. No. yes. Um, I've heard it like once. <laughs> I was going to say, if you didn't know it, I was going to play it on the computer, but I won't force you to listen to it again. It's good to exercise too. Sorry, my iPad. Okay, anyway. Uh, you are reading. Let me hand this out. And then let's talk about the Eagle of the Night. You're finishing the Dorothy Mills book. So here, Isabella, let me give you these two. And then if you guys, there should be one extra for Alice. And then if you guys would just kind of just give me a Okay, hey, hey guys, quiet down for a minute. Because there's Simeon saying, what's going on? Yeah. We're, I'm handing out the reading questions for next week. Oh, Well, see, I don't really do that. I mean, I'll give you some questions, but it's, it's a take home thing. Because I, I only get you for 30 weeks. I can't really spend two of them with you just sitting here writing. Yes. Okay, should we get, when should we give you back the so large questions? So we're not having blue books? Well, just a second, just a second. What do you like, mean? During Blue Book Week, when should we give you back? Like, you're going to give us like probably like large questions. Yes. When should we give them back? Um, well, here's the thing. I didn't, um, I didn't ask. I need to find out if we're actually coming back that next week for some sort of celebration. It says on the calendar I was given that we do. But I don't know. Um, it's sort of like a big potluck and just come and come and get mixed Well, but in. I want to make sure that's not Blue Book Week, that that's not next week, it's the week after. I want to bear. No, it, Blue Book Week is next week, which is actual community day where we all. Okay, and then there is together. another week. There is another week, which is you just can, like potluck. I, I will think. come and you can bring him then. All right. Um, and by the way, there's no new, that you don't have any more writing assignment. Unless, okay, here's the thing. Wait, 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 because we can take a poll here. Except it's not really a democracy. What? Like we can take a poll, but I get to decide. Poll for what? <laughs> if you like, I can email all of you blue book questions. I don't like that. End of semester exam. All right, we're going to call it semester exam. Um, and you could have two weeks to work on it. Um, instead of one or instead of zero? Instead of one. Okay. So why don't I do that? Why don't yes. I just, I will, I will do both. I will email them to you and then I'll bring questions in case you didn't see your email and, but you could go ahead and get started on them because I do not have another paper, obviously, for you to work on because we're at the yeah. end, you know, you wouldn't really have time. All right, I've collected your journals. So all you need to do for next week is finish the Dorothy Mills book. And that seems like you've got a lot of time on your hands because it's only it's not very long. Yeah. So I feel like if I send you your questions, you could start working on them. Yes. This? Okay. Now somebody needs to get out a piece of paper and write down. Send semester questions. I'll send you an email. Well, I would like to, to get a piece of paper as well. Oh well, no, I don't need that. Here, I will write it on the back of Alice's paper. Just give me your pencil. No, I got it. I got it. Just better. Send semester exam to Wednesday, junior high. Got it. Oh, thank you. Um, so let's, we finished up the Eagle of the Night. Was it a satisfying ending? Did you? Yes. Why do you think he didn't go back to Italy? Italy. Oh. Because he had his home in. Why? Um, okay, yeah. Oh. I, can, I can understand because he burnt his bird and he's like, he was just ready for something different and he found, he, he, he didn't think anything was wrong being a bird. What, what was one of the motivating factors do you feel like, because he used to fantasize about, I'm going to go back and get that farm. He said that he would always remember it. Do you think, okay, so at the beginning of the book, do you think if Marcus had been offered this opportunity to just go back to Italy at the beginning of the book, like right after he got injured, do you think he would have taken it? Yes. What do you think changed in him over the book?
that made him um, okay with not going back to that ancestral family. Okay. He got he got he got friends. Yeah. Definitely yes. Oh. He, so he has his connections in Britain. Is there anything in his soul that has healed? That he's sad. So sad, like his so funny thing. Yeah. Back. He he found out um, yeah. how yeah. what happened to yeah. his dad. That that must be such a great and terrifying feeling all at once. You know, because it was a disappointing thing too, wasn't it? He found out the Ninth Legion was not the paragon of virtue that he hoped it had been. It was already described as rotten. It was already rotten. But you know what he found out? His dad wasn't rotten. His dad fought to the end. He didn't join the rebellion. And you know, I wonder if that Marcus at the beginning of the book, it's like, oh, I miss my dad. You know, I, I mean, I've known people who have lost a parent young. Like, and to not know what happened to them on top of that would be awful. And so, you know, I wonder what happened, and then you hear rumors. Oh, that Ninth Hispano Legion, they're terrible, they probably just ran off. I don't think my dad would do that. I don't think my dad would do that. But all I have left of him is that home in Italy. That's all I have left. I need to go back there, because all I have to hold on to from him. But you know, he found out the truth, and maybe now he can let it go. I can make a new life. I've got a wife who's kind of wild, you know. Who? Katya. What? Oh, he was, they, they, arranged, they arranged an engagement between Katya and Marcus. When? I, I did not see it. And what? I thought she was 13. Oh, but that doesn't mean, okay, first of all, people married young, second of all. Okay, hang on. I'm like, this is great. What? <laughs> okay, in your I'm version, in your that's version, like it's okay. Yeah. Oh, they can. It's really I did not think it was all Hallmark. Was all right. <laughs> but it did, and I missed it. Okay, so she says she would go anywhere with him. Hey, wait a minute. I got to prove this to Ella. I'm sad now. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I just ruined this book well, for you. Okay. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> Well, because he asks, <laughs> Uncle Aquila asks, will Katya be content, you know, with what they're going to do? Um, I feel like there's, at some place, they talk about the engagement with, with what's his name, Kaito? I thought, her, her like, uncle? Um, he was more like a father figure. Oh my gosh. Just so, no. Oh no. Maybe there's different versions of the same book. No, there are not different versions. Oh my I'm sorry. Okay, I can't find. <laughs> But but that but it's, it's definitely implied in the will Katya be content with that? Yes, she will be content. And that I, I did that. She will go. She lived, and then she just wanted to like, you know, oh. be friends. And like, no, I'm sorry. I know. Okay, so <laughs> it was normal in the Roman Empire. Okay, so soldiers often didn't marry until later in life. This was true in Greece too. Um, say, like the Greek average male marriage age was 30, you know, like that was, but for girls it was more like 14, 15, oh. okay. So, uh, this is, oh, uh, anyway, I was going to go somewhere that I don't have time for. Anyway, it's, it's just, it's not predatory and it's okay. It's not okay now, but it was okay then. Oh, the poem. That is just true. Well, not really, but like, sorry. Okay, I have a poem and a question. And then you can go away. All right, aqueducts. There was water in the hillsides, but not enough in town. The Romans found a clever way to bring that water down. Aqueducts, they called them. The concept was quite new arches topped with channels to run the water through. The water came from streams and lakes from places far away. Engineering marvels, some still exist today. <laughs> Say goodbye. Well, actually, I have one for next week, too. Um, so here's my question. Do you have one for next year? No. Oh, my God.
Um, so let me ask you, I, you guys are gonna vote, and it, but it's gonna count, but not for you. It's gonna count for other people. Um, so I'm already, I'm putting together booklets for next year, but since the junior high kids just bump back and forth, I'm looking back at the books we read this year, and I would like to know your opinion, because this is the first time I've used it, of the Josephus books. That was good. Yeah. It was, the city didn't like it. Yeah. It was hard to say. Uh, I like Josephus more than, like, trying to read. Claudia! Okay, okay. Where it's the That book was hard to read. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Orwell. I'm trying to hear Ella. That book was so hard for me to read, but it was amazing because like I would go to youth group and we would be reading a book like a, a book of the Bible, and I could just spill out everything about the author because I've read that book. Okay, so here's let me let me. Um, okay, actually, go ahead. The worst part with Bible stories is that they've once got into all the war stuff. It was, yeah, it felt okay. like it lasted forever. Yeah, maybe like okay. the first part of the book. Cause, yeah, because the, okay. re- the other half was just like. Uh, yeah, but that's the part, part that I really like wanted to get in because of the that. attack on Rome yeah. or the attack on Jerusalem. I just say since we've already read the Bible a couple times, well, I've read most of the Bible once. I've probably gone through it about twice. I feel like the second part of the Bible is what the uh, second part of Josephus. The second yeah. part of Josephus is what's most, most important, and you've got yeah. to follow through the first part. Well, but a lot of people don't know those stories well, and they don't well, know them in order. Okay, here's here's a here's an idea. What if? Because this doesn't help you. I mean, it's already done. Like you, I did it. But your ne- the next group could be helped. What if we read the first half of it in the first semester when we're talking about ancient Greece and stuff, and then we waited and we read the second half in the second semester. So you don't spend like six or seven weeks Every reading day. the whole thing. And then you could read about ancient Israel and the rise of Israel when we're talking about yeah. Greece and Alexander, and then take a break, and then you wouldn't it wouldn't feel so long. And you could spend like three weeks in one semester and three weeks in another. And also until we have basis, that's a sparring book. You know what? I'm gonna I had several people talk to me about that. You know, you would not believe the number because I don't just randomly come up with these. I mean, I love these books, but also I usually consult places that are doing something similar to me online, a lot of places read that book in junior high level. And I guess it's because they don't have room in the high school curriculum or something, but I agree with you. I'm taking it out. My junior high kids are not good because um, it's just too, okay, no offense, it's just kind of too deep and hard for junior high age kids to, to get the emotions behind it and the, the, the relationship behind it. And I, I, I understood it. It was just very, I know, you loved it. Oh, no, I mean, it was just very, very depressing. It was, but it, I really like <laughs> that. She does, she does. 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 Well, I didn't realize you were different types. I appreciate your feedback because it helps me. It, I love certain books, but it doesn't do any good to give them to you if you guys don't get anything from them. Yeah, I think we borrowed Psyche to like uh, all the high school. Is it down in Rome and then Roman or Greek? That book. I'd like to just do a C.S. Lewis class. That book. Some C.S. Lewis? That book yeah, we don't have time for that. Okay, you guys can go, by the way. Oh, yeah, we might do oh, another one of those books. Here are my questions. Right. Bye, Alice.